You know my father, Dr. Trepan. You know that there is no more sociable or charming man than he, nor is there one of whom the profession has made a more deliberate assassin. I have often witnessed those marvelous operations which made him famous the world over. There is something truly phenomenal in his disregard for life. Once he had just performed a difficult laparotomy, and examining his patient, who was still under the influence of the chloroform, he suddenly said, This woman may have an affected pylorus. Suppose I also go into that stomach. I have time which he did, there was nothing wrong. Then my father started to sew up the needless wound he had made, saying, Now at least I'm certain. He was so certain that the patient died the very same night. <laughs> Another time in Italy, where he had been summoned for an operation, we were visiting a museum. I was enraptured. Ah, poet, poet, exclaimed my father, who was not interested for a moment in the masterpieces which carried me away with enthusiasm. Art, art, beauty, do you know what it is? Well, my boy, it is a woman's abdomen, open and all bloody, with the hemostats in place. But I won't philosophize any more, I'll narrate. From the tale I promised you, you will deduce all the anthropological conclusions of which it admits, if it really admits of any. This young man had so authoritative a manner and so bitter a tone that it made us shiver slightly. I was returning from Lyon, he continued, and I was alone in a first-class compartment. I've forgotten what station it was, but a traveller got on. I admit that the irritation of being disturbed when alone can bring about very violent states of mind. and arouse you to peevish behavior, but I experienced nothing of the sort. I was so bored with being alone that the chance arrival of this companion was rather a pleasure to me from the very start. He settled himself across from me after carefully depositing his few bags in the rack. He was a bulky man of common appearance whose greasy ugliness shortly became obnoxious to me. After a few moments, I felt something like an insuperable disgust in looking at him. He was stretched out heavily on the cushions, his thighs apart, and at every jolt of the train his enormous belly trembled and heaved like a disgusting mass of jelly. As he seemed hot, he took off his collar and sloppily mopped his forehead, a low, wrinkled, and bumpy forehead, raggedly framed by a few short, sticky hairs. His face was merely a lumpy mass of fat, his triple chin a slack flap of soft flesh spread on his chest. To avoid this unpleasant sight, I pretended to look at the countryside and forcibly tore myself away from the presence of this irksome companion. An hour passed, and when curiosity stronger than my will had drawn my eyes back to him, I saw that he had fallen into a deep and unprepossessed. I saw that he had fallen into a deep and unprepossessing sleep. He slept, sunk into himself, his head drooping and rolling up on his shoulders, and his huge, bloated hands lay open upon the slopes of his thighs. I noticed that his round eyes bulged beneath creased eyelids, and that a bit of bluish pupil showed through a slit, like an ecchymosis on a scrap of limp veal. What insane idea suddenly flashed through my mind? Truly, I don't know, for though I had been frequently tempted by murder, it lay in me in an embryonic state of desire, and had never, as yet, assumed the precise form of a gesture or an act. It is possible that the ignominious ugliness of this man alone was able to crystallize that gesture and that act. No, there is a more profound cause, of which I am ignorant. I arose quietly and approached the sleeper, my hands spread, contracted and violent as though to strangle him. With these words, being a storyteller who knew how to get his effects, he paused. Then, suddenly satisfied with himself, he continued. Despite my rather puny appearance, I am gifted with unusual strength, exceptional muscular agility, and extraordinary power of grip. And at that moment a strange heat unleashed the dynamic force of my bodily faculties. My hands alone moved towards this man's neck, by themselves, I assure you, burning and terrible. 
I felt in me a lightness, an elasticity, an influx of nervous tides, something like the powerful intoxication of sexual desire. Yes, I can't explain what I felt better than to compare it with that. The minute, the minute my hands were about to close upon this greasy neck, the man woke up. He awoke with terror in his eyes, and he stuttered, What? 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 And that was all. I saw that he wanted to say more, but he couldn't. His round eye flickered like a little light sputtering in the wind. Then it remained fixed and motionless upon me, in horror. Without saying a word, without even seeking an excuse or a reason by which the man would have been reassured, I sat down again across from him and nonchalantly with an ease of manner which still astonishes me, I unfolded a newspaper, which, however, I did not read. Fear grew in the man's eyes with every moment. Little by little he recoiled and I saw his face grow spotted with red, then purple, then it stiffened. All the way to Paris, the man's stare retained its frightful fixity. When the train stopped, the man did not get off. The narrator lit a cigarette in the flame of a candle, and from a cloud of smoke his phlegmatic voice was saying, Oh, I know well enough. I had killed him. He was dead of cerebral congestion. This story made us very uneasy, and we looked at each other stupefied. Was the strange young man sincere? Had he tried to mystify us? We awaited an explanation, a commentary, or an evasion, but he was silent. Grave and serious, he had resumed smoking, and now he seemed to be thinking of something else. From then on, the conversation continued, chaotic and lifeless, skimming a thousand frivolous subjects in a languid manner. Then a man with a ravaged face, a bowed back and mournful eyes, whose hair and beard were prematurely grey, arose with difficulty and in a trembling voice said, Up to now you have talked of everything but women, which is really inconceivable in a situation in which they are of primary importance. Fine, let's talk about them, agreed the illustrious writer, who now found himself in his favourite environment, for in the literary world he passed for that curious fool called a feminist writer. It's high time that all these bloody nightmares were infused with a little jollity. Let us talk of woman, my friends, since it is by her and through her that we forget our savage instincts, that we learn to love and are raised to the supreme conception of pity and the idea. The man with the ravaged face emitted a rasping, ironical laugh. Woman! Teacher of compassion! he exclaimed. Yes, I know the anthem. It is utilized a good deal in a certain type of literature and in courses in drawing-room philosophy. Why, her entire history, and not only her history, but her role in nature and life, contradicts this purely romantic concept. Why do women rush to bloody spectacles with the same frenzy that they fly? With the same frenzy... That they fly to the pursuit of passion. Why is it that you see them in the streets, at the theatre, in the court of Assizes, or beside the guillotine, craning their necks and eagerly straining their eyes to sights of torture, in order to experience, to the swooning point, the frightful thrill of death? Why does the very name of a great assassin make them tremble to the very depths of their flesh with a sort of delicious horror? All of them, or nearly all, dreamed about Pranzini. Why? Nonsense, exclaimed the illustrious writer. Prostitutes. No, said the man with the ravaged face. Noble women and bourgeoisies. It's the same thing. Among women there are no moral categories, only social categories. They are women. Among the common people and in the upper and lower middle class and right up to the most... Right up to the most elevated social strata, women pounce upon those hideous morgues and abject museums of crime that make up the fiction columns of the Petit Journal. Why? Because great assassins have always been formidable lovers. Their genetic powers equal their criminal powers. They love in the same way they kill. Murder is born of love, and love attains its greatest intensity in murder. There is the same physiological exaltation. There are the same gestures of strangling and biting, and often the same words occur during identical spasms. 
He spoke with difficulty, with an air of suffering, and as he spoke his eyes became more mournful, and the wrinkles in his face were more accentuated. Woman, dispenser of ideality and compassion, he went on. Why, the most atrocious crimes are nearly always the work of woman. Why, the most atrocious crimes are nearly always the work of woman. It is she who conceives them, organizes them, prepares them, and directs them. If she does not execute them with her own hands, which are often too weak, you find her moral presence, her ideas, and her sex expressed in their ferocity and implacability. Look for the woman, said the wise criminologist. You slander her, protested the author, who could not conceal a gesture of indignation. What you offer us is generalizations of the very rare exceptions. Degeneracy, neurosis, neurasthenia. My God, woman is no more impervious to psychical disease than man, although with her these disturbances assume a charming and touching form, which makes us better understand the delicacy of her exquisite tenderness. No, sir, you have fallen into a deplorable error. To the contrary, what we most admire in women is her great common sense and her great love of life, which, as I said before, finds its final expression in compassion. Literature, sir, literature. And the worst possible kind of literature. Pessimism, sir, blasphemy, stupidity. I think both of you are mistaken, interrupted a physician. Women are far more specialized and complete than you think. Incomparable virtuosi and great artists in grief that they are, they prefer the sight of suffering to that of death and tears to blood. And it's a wonderfully ambiguous business in which each finds what he is looking for. Since everyone draws quite different conclusions, we exalt woman's compassion or curse her cruelty for equally irrefutable reasons according to whether we are momentarily disposed to owe her gratitude or hatred. So what good are all these fruitless discussions? For in the external... Excuse me. For in the eternal battle of the sexes, we are always conquered. And we can do nothing about it, and none of us as yet, be he misogynist or feminist, has found a more perfect instrument of pleasure or any other means of reproduction than woman. But, but the man with the ravaged face made violent gestures of denial. Listen to me, he said. The hazards of existence and what a life I've had have placed me in the presence of... Not a woman, but woman. I have seen her stripped of the artifices and hypocrisies with which civilization veils her real soul. I have seen her abandoned to her single whim, or, if you prefer, to her soul-driving instincts, in an environment where nothing, it is true, can restrain them, and on the contrary, everything conspires to excite them. Neither laws, morals, religious prejudices, nor social conventions hid her from me. Nothing. It was her true self I saw in her original nudity, among gardens and torches, blood and flowers. When she appeared to me, I had fallen to the lowest point of human objection. At least I thought so. Then before her amorous eyes and her compassionate mouth I cried out with hope and I believed, yes, I believed that through her I would be saved. Well, it was something fearful. Women, uh, women revealed crimes to me, crimes that I had not known, shadows into which I had not yet descended. Look at my dead eyes, my inarticulate lips, my hands which tremble only from what I have seen. But I can no more curse her than I can curse the fire which devours towns and forests, the water which sinks ships, or the tiger which carries his bloody prey in his jaws into the depths of the jungle. Woman possesses the cosmic force of an element, an invisible force of destruction like nature's. She is in herself alone, all nature. Being the matrix of life, she is by that very fact the matrix of death, since it is from death that life is perpetually reborn, and since to annihilate death would be to kill life at its only fertile source. What does that prove? said the doctor, shrugging his shoulders. He answered simply, It proves nothing. Must things be proved in order to be painful or pleasant? They need only be felt. Then, timidly and Oh, the power of human vanity.
With visible self-satisfaction, the man with the ravaged face took out of his pocket a roll of paper, which he carefully unfolded. I have written, he said, the story of this period of my life. I have hesitated to publish it for a long time, and I still hesitate. I would like to read it to you, you who are men and have no fear of pluming the blackest of human mysteries. May you be able to withstand its bloody horror. It is called Torture Garden. Our host called for fresh cigars and fresh drinks. 